you all know that uh, for, well, as long as online banking exists, basically, we have attacks against individual users. Uh, we read about that. There's a lot of cases. You probably get email every day, trying to, someone trying to hustle you into giving them your uh, Barclays bank account, account, which you never use, which you don't even, uh, you're not even a uh, customer of the bank. But uh, this is like uh, something that's been going on, and it's really past present thing. The present thing, uh, maybe you notice that uh, we get more and more attacks against uh, corporate users because uh, that's more interesting, there's more money there. Now, it's not just the future, it's already uh, present. Attacks against direct, against uh, online banking servers. And in the future, we can expect attacks against the backend systems because that's where really the money is now. Individual users. So the method, methods are known. Uh, the goal is to steal the user's identity, right? So the attackers are using many methods like uh, phishing, cross-site scripting, uh, C-surf. Uh, uh, they install malware on users' computers. We're not going to be talking about that today. This is just like an intro. So uh, the attackers have many problems because banks and users are fighting back and they're making this more and more difficult. Next thing, corporate users, more interesting because uh, there's more money there. Uh, it won't be a surprise to a bank to see uh, a couple of million euros being, being uh, sent from the uh, bank account of a corporation to another corporation, because that's just daily business. It would be uh, suspicious if uh, an individual user did that, but not a com company. So the uh, organized crime is now going after the corporations as well. And uh, they have another problem, because if you want to attack individual users, you can just spam everyone. You can just buy uh, an email list of one million emails and just spam everyone. So I get uh, spammed with uh, uh, an attack that is aimed against users of a specific bank that I never even heard of, but they don't care. With uh, uh, corporate users, you want to be more targeted. So how do they find their targets? You have to know who to attack in a, in a specific company, who is the person doing the online banking? Well, one thing that is very useful uh, for the attackers are the uh, online publi uh, public directories of issued digital certificates. Uh, I don't know about the whole world, but in Europe, um, digital certificates are being mainly used for uh, online banking for corporations. So if you are a corporation, you are going to be using a smart card with the digital certificate to uh, do the online banking. Now, these, online, these uh, digital certificates are published in online directories. So anyone can find information on who in a specific company is, has been issued a certificate by one of the uh, certificate uh, authorities that are being used for online banking. Let me show you an example in our country. So yeah, we found a lot of uh, public directories of issued digital certificates. And in, specifically in our country, um, if you want to attack the company uh, that's listed below, uh, you can find the name of the person having issued a digital certificate for that com company, and also his email address. And that's all you need if you want to attack the company. Just don't attack these guys. If you want to attack a company, you can get this information. You know exactly who to target inside that company. But that's not the topic of our talk. The topic of our talk is here, so online banking servers. Now, in contrast to attacking users and corporations, where the goal was to steal their identity and then do whatever the application, the banking application allows any legitimate users to do, here, the attacker is interested in finding vulnerabilities and exploiting them in the, in the uh, online banking server. So the method is hacking, and uh, there is additional problem here. The attacker does not know of the vulnerabilities yet, so he has to try to find them. So there's an additional stage where the attacker can be detected. Now, the advantages are obvious. Um, there's well, basically all the money is in the bank, right? And not just all the money, even more money than all the money. What, I mean, what do I mean by that? You can actually create new money. 
Because banks do that all the time. Banks create new money every day and destroy money every day. We just don't see that. And it, since the money is digital, it's just a matter of a couple of bits and bytes in databases. And the uh, advantage for the attacker is that there is no social engineering required here. You don't have to hustle or trick anyone into doing something. You're just attacking the server directly. Now let's just move on to a couple of, a couple of vulnerability types and attack types that I've prepared for you. This will be somewhat simplified to make them more generic, but if you're familiar with uh, uh, how banks work, uh, you will, you will be, it will be easy for you to just translate that to, to a real case. Now direct resource access, who knows OWASP? Everyone probably. Well, this is one of the top vulnerabilities in all web applications. And online banking is mostly web-based. Even if you have a thick client, there's usually HTTP going in the background. So let's see what can happen here. This is a really lame example. <clears throat> you wouldn't believe that this would really exist in the real world. So we have a bank, we have a URL, and the user ID in the URL. So when I log into the bank and I, I click on this URL, I get my account balance data. <clears throat> but if I change, the ID to something else, I get someone else's account balance data. Who doesn't believe that this actually exists in the real world? Well, this really happened in Citibank. This exact thing. How lame is this? So this is the actual state of security today in the largest banks. Well, some of them. Not, not those that we've pen tested. But. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's not usually the case. Usually the arguments are base64 encoded. Because that really... <laughs> yeah, really. So <clears throat> when you do the pen testing and you see this, of course, when you see the uh, typical characters of base64, of course, first thing you do, you decode this. And if you find something like this, you just base64 encode something else and request it and you get someone else's. We actually see this in real world. But the better banks have gone further. They're using URL encryption. So you see something like this. It's again base64 encoded, so uh, it's not a problem per se if, if it's encrypted. Uh, or you have hex encoding. So whenever you see something like this, the first instinct of a hacker is, let's try to decode this first and see what's hiding behind. So what's usually hiding behind is a code like this. So we have uh, the same types of params that we used in the, in the previous slides. And then we're encrypting this with some encryption key. And then we add that to the URL. So the application gives us a link that is encrypted. And when you click on the link, it, it receives the request and decrypts the link. It's much better than what we saw before, because we would need to know the key to, to be able to encrypt something that the server will understand. But it still happens that it's easy to guess the code if, you, if you're really motivated. And the second problem is that some people actually know the key. The people in the bank, the developers, those who have, who have actually selected the key, know the key. So it's not, not a really good idea if that guy who knows the key leaves the bank and then still knows the key, he can still get access to other people's accounts. You're speaking about FINA code software. I'm sorry? No, uh, well, it can be, it can Last be. Is very in this <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not naming anyone specifically. So the developers uh, being aware of this problem uh, usually make it a little bit more difficult for you to, uh, to guess what's going on in the background. So they add some, some salt to the original uh, arguments. And they even add some random, which is a good idea. If you add some random data, then uh, it will be more difficult to guess what's happening in the background if you don't know the code. But we still have that guy who knows this code and he knows this key. So doing this is not a good substitute for actual server-side authorization of the received request. So whenever you see something like this in the URL, you know there's something fishy going in the background. Now, we're not here to steal other people's data. The bank robber wants to actually steal money. So we can apply this knowledge to stealing money. 
we have a similar case. We have a transfer URL here. We have a source account, a destination account, and an amount, right? So this is like what I, want, what I would do if I want to transfer money from my account to someone else's. And of course, by the same token, if we change the source account, the, the application does not allow me to do this through the GUI, so I have to do it manually. But if I do this, and there's no server-side validation or, or if, it, if it can be bypassed, then money can be taken from someone else's account instead of mine. So how does it, this work, this money transaction? Let's go, let's go a little bit deeper into that. So we have the user with the browser and the, the online banking server. First of all, the user decides that he wants to make a, a transfer of his funds. So the server provides an empty transaction form. Is there anyone who doesn't use online banking? We have, we have two guys who are really secure here. Okay, so I can go really, really quickly through that. So you get an empty transaction form uh, that you can fill out. So you, you select your account, you select the other account and, and the amount uh, of money you want to transfer and a few other data that, that's not important here. So the server then uh, sends you a, a filled out form just for the confirmation so that you, you don't mistakenly send money to someone else. So you, you, it allows you to confirm what you decided to, to do. Now, the validation of data first can be done here on the client side, right? And, and it, you know, it always is. If you want to enter a negative number into the amount you want to transfer, the, the uh, JavaScript probably won't let you, right? So, so the, the browser will not let you do that. You cannot just type it in. And if you, you, you cannot even select someone else's account from the drop-down box. There, there are only your accounts there. So that, that's kind of like more user-friendly uh, validation than anything security-related. So that we, we all know that you can hack this, so you cannot rely on that. Now, there's a server-side validation in this step. So whenever I provide some data, I want to do this and that with my money, the server set, uh, validates my data and, and looks at it and says, okay, this guy's trying to do something. Can he do that? Does he have, uh, does he have uh, authorization for this account? Is the amount okay? And so on. And then the server returns that form to me. And when I confirm it, it can validate it again. Well, the most important validation is the third one. Because after that's been done, the server is going to say, OK, this validation is OK. I'm going to send it to backend. And the backend just does everything that the server tells it to do. Frequent, er frequent security error here is that the server only does validation number two. So if you change your data in the confirmation form, you can bypass that validation and give the backend server whatever you want it to give. Next case is negative numbers. Would you believe that you can actually use negative numbers in online banking systems? Yes. Yes, I would too. Okay. This guy's from the bank. He knows what he's talking about. Okay, negative numbers are surprisingly often overlooked. <coughs> Let's see. This is a typical line of code that does the validation of the amount that we selected. So we want to transfer 100 euros, and this is the line of code that says, is, he, is, is it okay? Does he have 100 euros? So if I want to transfer 3,000 euros and I have only 2,000 on my account, this line is going to block my attempt. But if I do this, if I want to transfer minus 100 euros, this line will have no problem with that. So checking for negative numbers is very often overlooked. Maybe not in the entire online banking application, but if you, if you can find one place where it's overlooked, you can do some funny things with that. So this is the actual case. The attacker has an empty account balance. The victim has 100 euros. The attacker transfers minus 100 euros to the victim. Very generous of him, right? So the end result is that the attacker has 100 and the victim has a zero. So it was, it, it's the same as a transaction from the victim to the attacker, only triggered by the attacker. This is really cool. This is a very little known problem. If you, if you try to browse Google, if you, if you search Google for, for this specific problem, it's really not easy to find references. I only found, found a couple. 
But in the banking sector, they're very well uh, aware of that after our pen test. Yeah, the, yeah, but but. No, the, the the business logic behind this is, whatever the, is the amount to transfer, this amount will be subtracted from my account and added to his account, right? So if minus one hundred is subtracted from my account, it's like adding adding one hundred to my account. Sorry. Yeah, minus minus. So I get I get a plus. Now let's see um, something that we once came across. A similar case. We're going to transfer minus one hundred euros, but not to another per person's account, but to our own savings account. Now savings accounts are just like any other account. They have a specific property that they don't cannot have a negative balance. Well, at least those that we see. Now the problem, well the problem, this is actually an advantage for the attacker. If we want to transfer minus 100 euros from a normal account to a savings account, this is what we get. We get 100 euros, but we do not get minus 100 euros on the savings account because it cannot have a negative value. Now the business logic said, that is not okay. I'm not going to do that part of the transaction. This is an actual case. And what's, what's fun with this is that you can actually create new money. Before we had a total of zero euros. Now we have a total of 100. So there's actually more money in existence because of this failed transaction. Next thing, bypassing limit checks. Banks like to impose limits on us. They don't like us to, to transfer 1 million euros from our account if we don't have them. And I understand them, I wouldn't do that either. But due to uh, errors in business logic, there, you can possibly find ways to bypass that because maybe th there's insufficient validation on the server, any other, any other thing, any other reason. Uh, let me just show you what can happen if, if, you do, if you find that. So you have two accounts, one with 100 euros, the other one empty. If you can uh, bypass the limitations, and it can be possible because code is written by people and we make errors, right? This is the case. No extra money is in existence now because the total is the same as before. But you actually have a huge minus on one account and a huge plus on the other account. Now, if you're an honest guy, you would add those two together and say, yeah, I owe, I owe the bank. You'd probably be, be worse off because you would be paying a lot of interest for the, for the overdraft. But the, if you're a criminal, you would just take those million euros and go to Hawaii, right? And you forget about the debt to the bank. So that is why the bank does not want you to make larger overdrafts than those that uh, they authorized to you. This, can, this was actually a case in, in one of our pen tests. Uh, next to uh, HTTP parameter pollution. This is a, uh, a class uh, of HTTP vulnerabilities uh, discovered by Luca Caretoni and Stefano Di Paola. Did I pronounce that correctly? Excellent. It's a very good idea, actually. Let me show you what this means in, in the banking system. So we have a communication between the, the user and the online banking server, which is running a JSP code at this time, and the backend server running a PHP code. It's not very usual for backend uh, servers to run PHP code, but for our, for our example here, let's suppose it's so. So the user wants to transfer 100 euros from account one to account two. Now the code on this JSP server reads the arguments from the URL and does some validation. You see, if not user authorized for source account, then error. So I cannot actually um, provide another person's account to, uh, to the server. They would reject that. And also it makes a test that if, uh, if I do, don't, do not have enough disposable uh, funds on my account, also I get an error. So this is, this is typical validation of the user data. 
Now the code says if those checks were okay, then I'm going to forward that request to the backend server. And it does that in another post transaction. So it just forwards the same, same parameters that were used before to the backend server. Now the backend server reads those parameters and does the transaction. That's it. Now the HTTP parameter pollution is this. We add another argument to the URL. It doesn't have to be URL. It can be in, in post data as well. So we have two source arguments here. Now what happens, the guys who are, uh, who are researching HTTP parameters uh, pollution, they uh, analyzed various servers, various uh, frameworks in terms of what they do if they encounter uh, two parameters with the same name. Now it turns out that in JSP takes the first parameter. So we have the same situation as before. Now, when the request is forwarded to the backend, PHP takes the second parameter. Now, you can see this can be used for bypassing validation on, on the first server. But of course, no one's that silly, so we have another layer of, or, of authorization uh, in the backend. So we say if user is not authorized for the source account, we're not going to do the transaction. We can still do something else. We can change the amount. So now we have two amount arguments, and all the validation will pass correctly, although the back end will have the amount of 100,000 euros, which I do not have on my account. So this is a, a perfect example of a vulnerability that allows you to do some of the things that I mentioned before, so bypassing limit checks. SQL injection, well, it's pretty boring, but you still have it everywhere, and of course you also have it in online banking systems. It's funny that when we talk to, to the banks uh, before the pen test, we always get uh, skeptical looks, and they say, no, SQL injection won't be possible in our case, no, no. And they have hundreds of reasons. But we always find at least one case where we can do it. So it's really a, an important vulnerability in banking system as well. So you're familiar with this. This would be a typical, typical case if someone hacked the uh, SQL query for, uh, for getting the exchange rate for a specific currency and then replaced the uh, unvalidated argument with something like this. This is a classic example. But again, a bank robber is not here to steal data. He's here to steal money. Now let's steal money. This is a typical simplified version of what happens when someone transfers money from one account to another. So we have an actual SQL transaction, which means that either all SQL queries will be successful or none of them. This is the basic hygiene of uh, banking industry. But we have two update queries. So whenever I transfer money from my account to another, the uh, balance on my account has to be changed and the balance on the other account has to be changed accordingly. Makes sense. So these are the two updates uh, queries. So my account is going to be changed to zero and uh, my account balance and the, the other account's balance is going to be changed to 100. But the, if these arguments are not properly validated, well, this is a case how it would actually work in a, in a normal case. This would be a SQL injection. So even though we have a transaction, SQL transaction, the first query will actually set my account number, uh, my account balance to zero, but the second one will set the other accounts and my account's balance back to 100. So we again created money out of nothing. This is something completely different. Banking signatures. Are you, when you're using online banking, do, you, do your banks provide an option for you to, uh, to make an online deposit so that you can then uh, digitally sign uh, a deposit uh, agreement? Do you have that? Anyone? Okay. Where are you from? Austria. Austria. Excellent. We have that in our country as well. So what banks are doing, they are really enthusiastic about this digital certificates and digital signatures because we have the, the laws that we need to make these this, uh, signatures valid in the court and we have the technology and the users are already have their digital certificates. So why not automate some of these processes? So let's see how that works. 
If the user wants to deposit 100 euros for 31 days, he makes a request to the banking server. And the server says, okay, this is the deposit agreement that you need to sign. And it's, it's dynamically generated from the data that user has, has provided. And the server also decides what the uh, interest rate would be for your deposit. And this is all the, the data that you get and you're supposed to sign. So the user signs the deposit agreement and sends it to the server and the server countersigns it with the banking certificate, which is on the server. Now this is a legal document enforceable in court. If you go to the court and take this digitally signed document, the court will say, you are right, this is true, this is a real agreement between you and the bank, even though there was no person on the other side. Now, where do you see the problem here? Well, a malicious user can modify the agreement, and if the server is not careful, it will sign the modified agreement. But the modified agreement can be anything, not just increasing the interest rate for, from 2% annually to 2 million percent annually, which would be like a nice way to earn money. But the text of the agreement can also be changed. So it, it, it may no longer be a deposit agreement. It can be a statement from the bank that all their uh, real estate is now yours. Well, hypothetically, that would not work. But yeah, anything can be changed, not just numbers. And then, of course, the classic, the server-side code execution. As you can see, everything I'm talking about here requires zero user interaction. So these are attacks against the banking servers. You don't have to social engineer anyone. So the server-side code execution is nothing special in, in the banking industry. So uh, I don't want to go through this in, in, in too much detail. But the, the impact, what the attacker would like to do if he manages to, to execute code on the server is to change the e-banking application code, of course, because that code includes business logic that prevents you from doing some nasty things. And you can, if you can remove that logic from the application, then you can attack the system. And uh, what the holy grail for the attacker would be to get the opportunity and credentials to send direct requests to the backend. Because the backend trusts the server, the, the online banking server, that it has done some validation before. So whatever the online server says to the backend, the backend can provide some, uh, can execute some additional validations, but it essentially has to trust that there was a user behind this request even though the attacker was actually behind the request. Now, I know you all came because of this. Because, yeah, you like the vulnerabilities, you, you, you would like hypothetically to hack banks, but you don't want to go to jail. Now, I'll give you a way to do that. This attack is about rounding and currency exchange. Now, suppose you have an exchange rate such that for one euro you get 1.364 dollars. It's pretty much there today. Now if you exchange one euro cent, you, will, you should get this much dollars, but because of the rounding, you will get less, right? So you make a nice little loss. So what should we do? Yeah, make it the other way around. If we exchange one dollar cent for one euro cent, because of the rounding, you, you actually will get one euro cent? Will you, not work. Sorry? Will not work. Will not work. That's, that, the rounds always to their profit. Sorry? The, the, the rounding in the bank is always to their profit. No? Okay. No? The rounding is specified by European Union. If they are in club, they cut. They do not round up. Yes, they do. My bank does. My bank does. I tested it. It works. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Oh, 
oh, you have a bad bank, because <laughs> all the banks I've seen are doing the rounding like this. Okay, let, let's talk about that later. So let, let's just see what you can do with this, and we'll, we'll take a look at your bank later. It's funny that this has been known for a decade. There's even a paper out there with a URL here. The guys were uh, writing about this. They were thinking about ways to counter this problem. And it's been known for a long time. And still, many banks allow you to do that, except his bank. <laughs> so what would be the, the algorithm that you use? You start for, with 100 euros, for example, and you uh, exchange that to dollars, so you get $136.40. And then you make a loop. You repeat 13,640 times, convert that one dollar cent to one euro cent, and you get 36.40 euro of profit. And go to one. So you do it as long as they let you. Now, how fast can you get rich doing that? If we assume 10 exchanges per second, because th th there can be some, some throttling on the server side which prevents it from doing it too fast, so you have to join with your friends, so you all do it at the same time. You can have uh, a daily profit of uh, over 2,000 euros and a nice monthly profit which lets you leave your job immediately. But you, you'll probably, uh, your bank will probably notice it and will do something about it, so you'll have to hop the banks and eventually no bank will be doing this anymore. So what can be improved here? Because uh, doing this for a month, it takes a long time and it, probably someone will notice that something's happening. Uh, whoever is, is in charge of your account in bank, they will see that you have hundreds of thousands of transactions. It could trigger some, some suspicion. But if you want to optimize this, you should have, because of the rounding, you should get as close as possible to 0 0.005, because that's where the rounding provides the biggest difference. But remember that you, you earn less than one cent in each transaction, so it's really low profit. In corporate banking, banks are making it easier for you. Well, of course, companies can do that as well, but banks make it easier for you because you can, you can use, uh, they, they uh, provide an option for you to, uh, to, to uh, package the requests. In, in single packets and then sign those packets and send those packets to the bank. So you can, you can do uh, more offline and just send it as a single packet to the bank. And yeah, it works on my personal bank and also our corporate bank allows us to do that. Uh, we just stole one cent, so yeah, I don't think they'll take, they'll mind. Now the countermeasure is really simple and that's what we tell our customers. Just don't let users exchange less than one whole unit of the larger currency. So if, if you prevent making the exchanges of less than one euro, for instance, all this goes away. Because every, everything you earn with the rounding there, you lose with the, with the different exchange rates, the buy and sell exchange rates. So you lose everything there. This is a very simple countermeasure. Question. No, uh, yeah, exactly, but, but if, if this attack actually requ requires you to, to make exchanges to another country, com, com, um, currency and then back, right? And, and you have different exchange rates for, diff for, 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 for and you lose everything, everything you earn, you lose when you exchange it back because they have a, quite a difference between sell and buy rates. Yeah. No, it doesn't, but we can we can do the math later, okay? Now getting away with it. Wouldn't you want to? Why should we even care? If we're not actual bank robbers, why should we even learn about getting away with it? Well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't learn much about it.
because we don't need that kind of uh, knowledge. But we should know uh, at least a bit about it because uh, when you're talking to a bank and you show them their vulnerabilities, at some point some guy will tell you, yeah, but you, you wouldn't get away with it because we'll, we would, someone would catch you. So you need, to, you need to have an answer to that because if the conversation stops at that point, it may even lead to, to their uh, wrongful understanding that the vulnerabilities that they have don't really matter. So you want, you want to make sure that they fix those vulnerabilities and if, in order to do that, they have to believe that someone could actually exploit them. <coughs> so first thing to do, the attacker would have to avoid detection. When, when he wants to attack a bank, he first has to find some vulnerabilities in that bank. And in the process of finding these vulnerabilities, he would create some noise and he might get noticed. And to access most of the bugs that we, uh, that we covered here, the attacker would have to actually log in to the bank first. Now, if you want to log in to the, to, to the bank, to, to your bank account, you would have to have one. So it means you had to come to the bank, present your ID, which means that you can be traced back. If they notice that user 123374 is doing something funny, like looks like cross-site scripting or buffer overflow exploitation, and let's send someone from the police to their home and see what they're doing. So the attacker would have to hide behind someone. And we call this user in the middle. It's like man in the middle, browser in the middle. The attacker is using the same technique user in the middle. He hacks some legitimate user's account and does all the hacking through that account. Now, it's not a new concept, but it's a way to hide uh, the attacker's identity. Now, the most important thing that is not specific to, to hacking uh, banks directly, the, the uh, criminals that are now stealing money from users and corporations, are already having this problem and solving it really well, is how to break the money trail. So as long as you can transfer money from one bank to another, but it's still traceable, it's still digital money, it's still in the system. So their goal is to extract it from, the, from the, this digital banking system. And they, they, they're employing money mules. You're probably getting emails like this all the time, trying to recruit you. They give you 10% of the proceeds if you just uh, cash in some checks, or if you uh, receive some money on your account, then uh, withdraw the cash and give it to someone. So this is really classic. But also, uh, digital money in all sorts uh, that exist today can be used to, uh, to cover your tracks, right? And th this is what the attackers are doing today, and, th and they will continue doing it. And one thing that we haven't seen yet or haven't read yet about, but uh, can possibly happen in the future, is chaining the users in the middle. So when, when, someone, when the attacker steals some money uh, from the bank, he transfers that money not to his own account, but to someone else's account, which has al already been hacked in another country. And from that account, to yet another hacked account to another country. So this means that he's buying a lot of time to actually extract that money from the system before the police comes. Now the perfect crime would be to create new money so that nobody loses anything. If you steal money from a user, the user will eventually notice that and uh, he will say, all right, the bank, someone took my money, take a look into this, but we've seen cases where money can be actually created out of nothing, it's less likely that someone will notice that because no one has lost anything. No one will, will complain, so it's just new money. And this can be done either by, uh, uh, with types of attacks that I described before or if you remember the first slide, in the future, future 2.0, there's the, in the back end, the DBA, for instance, the database admin, can actually do that today. He has all the access to change numbers in the database. <coughs> Not in a, transactional way, in a transactional way, but in a way that creates new money. So this can be really hard to track. If he knows what he's doing and he knows what the, what the uh, controls are for uh, validation controls and, and sanity checks are in the bank, he can actually create new money without anyone ever noticing. 
Now, the attacker's best friend, this, this is what we hear all the time. And, and probably some of you are thinking to, uh, right now, no, this would not work on my system because of this and that reason. And it, it probably wouldn't. Not, not everything would work on every system, obviously. But for a, for a bank, it's really critical if anything works anywhere in their system. And that is why testing is better than believing. Now, for the attacker, it's very good that banks are adopting new technologies and are trying to automate more and more processes. So we've seen automated deposits and the new threats that they bring. We will see automated small loans in the future, that's for sure. Because right now, the bank, banks don't want to automate loans because they have these uh, complex procedures in the background. They want, to, they want to see whether you're worthy to get a loan. But for small loans, they will start doing that at some point. And when one bank starts doing that, the other, others will follow quickly. And this will just expand the, the uh, attack surface. Many banks also allow you to trade in stocks. Now, think about it. Can you actually buy minus 300 Apple shares? That doesn't make, doesn't make sense to, to a human. But to a computer, this is just a number. So if it's just a number, Many interesting things can happen. Well, thank you. This was all I had for you. I hope you will behave well. Please don't, if you use this, don't tell anyone you heard it from me.